Hey everyone, welcome to Constructed Chaos. I've been doing a ton of research over the last couple of weeks to compile a list of the five Radish Dragons from the latest D&D 5e sourcebook. So before I didn't burn to a crisp, let's talk about dungeons and dragons and dragons and dragons and dragons and dragons and dragons. And dragons. So all jokes aside, I should mention that Fizban's Treasury of Dragons is full of a ridiculous amount of detail on each of these dragons. And as I began to compile information for this video, I realized that it would be nearly impossible to go over every single tidbit for even just five of these bad boys. For that reason, I'll be covering most of the lore, appearance, and personality details about these dragons, but I'll be sticking to the most interesting parts when it comes to their layers, abilities, and combat mechanics. And so we start off our list with the mightiest of all the gym dragons. Amethyst dragons are gifted with psionic abilities that grant them the power to manipulate the very foundations of reality, such as space and gravity. Consumed by these abilities and the knowledge of their inner workings, they devote themselves to the observation and the study of the multiverse and even the echoes of themselves found in other iterations of reality. <laughs> Amethyst dragon hordes typically include all of the usual gold and gems, but their most prized possessions are usually magical items that manipulate space and reality, as well as tomes that cover subjects like extraplanar travel. Mature dragons of this nature are made up of translucent purple amethysts that glow from within. Their eyes are typically a pure white or pale lavender color with no pupil, and get this, they have detached horns that float above their heads, held aloft by their intrinsic psionic powers. Even though the nature of the outer planes intrigues them, they are almost always fiercely opposed to any intrusion of the unknowable far realm that lies beyond even their understanding. They are quite fond of flumps, however, and who could blame them? <laughs> Those who wander into this dragon's home may find rooms full of glowing amethyst clusters as well as tall chimneys that connect an upper cavern area to a lower one. However, space is manipulated in such a way that it's entirely possible for someone or something to fall indefinitely down the chimneys, teleporting instantly back up to the top when they reach the bottom unless some outside force can stop them, that is. Surrounding this cave, one might find that wildlife reproduces abundantly, and amethyst crystals and geodes form near the edges of surrounding bodies of water. The dragon affects the environment in these ways, but is also connected in such a way that they can cast the legend lore spell once per day within a mile of their lair, and the clairvoyant spell through a nearby body of water within six miles. One funny observation regarding that detail is that the clairvoyant spell says that any creature benefiting from true sight or see invisibility can see the otherwise invisible sensor that clairvoyance produces. That sensor is typically then seen as a luminous orb about the size of your fist. But would that mean that the orb is then the size of a dragon's fist? <laughs> Let me know down in the comments, but imagine being surprised by a massive, glowing, intangible orb floating above a body of water surrounded by amethyst crystals. Moving on to this thing's stat block, an ancient amethyst dragon has three legendary resistances per day and can breathe both air and water. Within its lair, the dragon can perform one of its lair actions on initiative count 20, so long as it isn't choosing the same lair action twice per row. You'll see that these details are pretty consistent amongst all the dragons, so that might be the last time I mention it. Of those legendary options, it can attempt to charm a creature with a DC 15 wisdom saving throw within its 120 foot range of telepathy until the next round. It can cast the force cage spell using a DC 23 charisma save to leave the bounds of that cage, and that doesn't disappear until the spell is recast or the dragon dies and it can spatially project itself anywhere within its lair until the next round, allowing it to appear and disappear at opportune moments for subjecting the party to its other attacks and abilities. And get this, the breath weapon is called Singularity Breath, and if that doesn't get you already excited for an encounter with one of these, I don't know what I can do for you. The attack itself releases gravitational energy from the dragon's mouth in a 90-foot cone with a DC 23 strength save 
against 14 d8 damage and having a creature's speed reduced to zero. As you might have guessed, these dragons also have a pretty potent talent for spellcasting and can call forth some really awesome spatial magics like Blink, Plane Shift, and Globe of Invulnerability to name a few. When it comes to bonus actions, the dragon can magically teleport up to 60 feet away and it can change its shape into any medium or small creature, all while retaining its same stat block. I'd say that something like this could actually make for a really interesting or somewhat quirky NPC that pops up randomly to help adventurers as it observes the multiverse in disguise from up close. And of course, being a CR23 ancient dragon definitely comes with several legendary actions to round off the old stat block. The most notable of these, and the one unique to this creature, is the explosive crystal this dragon can spit within 60 feet. Each creature within a 20 foot radius sphere must make a DC 23 dex save or take 48 force damage and be knocked prone. 48 may not seem like a lot, but when this dragon has so many abilities that allow it to move freely and project a copy of itself within its lair, being stuck prone and unable to get in close is not where you want to be. But combat ability alone isn't what landed the Amethyst Dragon this spot on the list. It's also the ability to play this dragon in so many different ways. Being that they're typically true neutral, an Amethyst Dragon could literally be anything in your campaign, from a big bed, to a quest patron, to a mysterious force nudging the party in the right direction. In similar fashion, our next entry falls typically under the neutral alignment, but based on its description, it can vary way more extremely in one way or another. Perhaps I'll show my own bias here as I've already adopted a bit of lore into my own campaign setting revolving around such a creature. At number four, we have Dragon Turtles. These creatures can both be affectionate and outright genocidal when it comes to landlocked life. Some exist as guardians of the sea and will attack those that steal nature's bounty without offering something in return, while others enjoy singing along with sea shanties and swimming aside vessels in the ocean. But this isn't our first time actually seeing a dragon turtle. They were originally introduced in 5e with the monster manual, although this will be our first time getting to know them in such detail and the first time we get to see stats for ancient dragon turtles. More on that in a moment. As you could probably guess, this unique flavor of dragon can only be found in watery environments, typically within the ocean. Many choose to live in areas close to the shore so that they can either trade or prey upon land-dwelling creatures, but some are more solitary and live deep within oceanic trenches and underwater volcanoes. Regardless of where they call home, these creatures will cause changes in the environments around them, such as irregular currents that cost double movement speed to swim through, even if you have a swim speed, two-way portals to the elemental plane of water, and geothermal vents that can heat the surrounding water to a near boil. Dragon turtles don't tend to be very picky either, seemingly content with just finding a hole they can sleep in for years or decades at a time but they do get access to several layer actions starting at their adults or ancient forms that allow them to produce strong currents that can push creatures up to 30 feet back at a time, restrain a group of creatures with kelp, and erupt a cone of steam from up to 120 feet away for a potential 66 fire damage. But assuming you make it past all that, you may come upon an assortment of sunken gold and treasure along with other oddities that have fallen into the sea and been repurposed or misunderstood by their dragon turtle owner. Most of these surface items would be made of stone and metal as wood and paper and cloth don't hold up very well underwater. Wherever you find this hoard, its shelled curator is likely to be near. Most often they'll nestle into a higher region of their home where a small amount of air is trapped and they can look down upon their spoils. They're likely to attack any hoping to take some of their treasure for themselves. And that brings us to combat. This gargantuan creature has some really intense abilities, as you might expect for a CR24 stat block. For one, their boiling aura legendary action causes the turtle to radiate intense heat 20 feet all around it. And any creature that starts its turn in that area and fails a DC 24 con save takes 98 fire damage. Similarly, its steam breath has the same saving throw but causes 15 D8 fire damage. 
and it's worth noting that being underwater doesn't change these effects in the slightest. But what's even more impressive is that they're given an ability called Blessing of the Sea, which allows them to reset their hit points to 350 if they would have been dropped to zero instead. And after activating this passive ability, they'll gain access to mythic actions, which can be used alongside their other legendary actions. Mainly, the mythic action that we'd be interested in is called Armor of Storms. Activating this for only two of its three legendary actions gives it 40 temporary hit points until the start of its next turn as lightning arcs around its body. Until those hit points are gone, any creature that touches it or hits it with a melee attack takes 4d12 lightning damage. With absolutely epic abilities like these, it's hard to remember that a dragon turtle could actually be quite friendly to strangers. You could easily encounter one of these on the open sea as it gives you directions to the nearest island settlement, or maybe that settlement exists on the back of one of these massive monsters. Next, we have an entry that should leave nothing to question as far as alignment is concerned. The most quintessential of their kind when it comes to personality, green dragons are often the most prideful, manipulative, and deadly. One might be more suspicious of a green dragon pretending to be your friend than one announcing that they are your enemy. Unlike many other chromatic dragons, they typically live in solitude and prefer not to take on followers and subjects, unless they're saving them as a snack for later. Still, they certainly don't shy away from the settlements of other creatures as they love using the efforts of others to procure a home and food unwillingly provided by lesser creatures such as a hollowed tree or an underground network of caverns below a forest. Once such a place of residence is taken up, a green dragon may take a bit of time to decorate with the bones of past meals in order to showcase its power and strike fear into those who stumble in. Though, don't believe for a second that wandering creatures might find their way there by accident. These cunning predators might use indistinct whispers on the breeze within a mile of their lair to lure any creature of moderate intelligence. It can even warp the throats and mouths of tiny creatures in the same area to cast its own voice out, using one effect to signal a safe haven and the other to scare creatures towards it. After being successfully lured into a green dragon's lair, they may employ an especially large number of potential lair actions, including a magical charming fog, a wall of thorny brush that both damages and slows those who travel through it, living roots that ensnare creatures in a 20-foot radius, vines that can animate humanoid corpses, and large tap roots that lash out when all else might fail. As you can see, much of the danger presented with a green dragon comes from its scheming nature. Its ability to trick and trap adventurers before even baring its fangs earns it a spot on this list. But that's not to say that an ancient green dragon stat block isn't menacing as well. While their wing attack legendary action can leave a lot to be desired in terms of flavor, the real punch comes in when considering this creature's frightful presence action, which can be used with every multi-attack. This ability states that each creature of the dragon's choice within 120 feet of them that are aware that the dragon exists must succeed a DC 19 wisdom save or become frightened for a full minute. At such a point, the dragon may find it quite easy to strike out at their prey as they flee in horror. Though it is worth noting that any creature that succeeds the save or makes it through that one minute of fright is immune to its effects for the next 24 hours. But even then, enemies of this dragon must contend with its Poison Breath, which deals 22d6 poison damage should any targets within its 90-foot cone fail a DC 22 con save. Now, one might argue that poison is a relatively underwhelming damage type in 5e, and I'd agree. But I'd also point out that due to this dragon's nature, it's quite likely that an adventuring party would have been whittled down by traps and schemes employed by this maniacal creature along the way, making it all the more menacing when they finally come face to face. In contrast to the macabre nature of this great evil worm, our next entry lands most often at the opposite end of the spectrum. 
Moonstone dragons have been suffused with the energies and charm of the Feywild and begin their lives as playful and mischievous creatures, though many of them do evolve into more mature teachers and storytellers in the later years. They have opalescent scales and emerald green strands of fur that run off their chins, chest, back, and tails. They also have long slender horns in the back of their heads that seem to follow the contour of their snout to a smaller horn at the tip of the nose, forming something resembling a crescent moon. Like other gem dragons, they have a deep psionic connection, but this particular breed is most adept at infiltrating and shaping dreams. They often use their power to inspire sleeping creatures near their lairs, guiding adventurers towards their goals and haunting the dreams of those who have wronged them. More so than other dragons on this list, the lair of a moonstone dragon is uniquely magical and often spans across the material, feywild, and ethereal planes all at the same time. This feature is also seemingly indicative of the dragon's relative inability to keep track of what plane they're actually on. But this is rarely a problem for them as they haphazardly open portals between the three planes on a whim and sometimes forget to close the door behind them leaving the possibility open for adventurers and other creatures to accidentally wander in. And supposing you might, you'd then be on the hook for any of the dragon's layer actions, which could easily be flavored as being involuntarily used by the Moonstone Dragon. Given its nature, it could either purposefully or accidentally send you to a harmless demiplane of dreams for a round, cause you to waltz around effectively incapacitated, or cause you to endure disorienting visions, making it hard for you to perform ability checks. I, for one, can't imagine many situations where an adventuring party would need to face off against a Moonstone Dragon, but they can be known to cause problems and, inadvertently, is just the case that, let's take a look at this thing's stat block. <laughs> Noticeably absent at first glance is the usual teleportation ability had by other gem dragons. However, the gem dragons of the Moonstone variety gain access to a second breath weapon in its place, even though each cycle on the same recharge roll stat. The first breath weapon, called Dream Breath, can cause creatures within its 90-foot cone to fall unconscious for 10 minutes or until it takes damage or another creature tries to wake it with an action. Considering it requires a DC 21 con save to pass, I'd say this does hold at least some potential to wipe out an entire unlucky party in one go. But assuming that doesn't do the trick, the dragon's moonlight breath could easily take care of everyone else with its precise 120 foot beam that's 10 foot wide. This breath weapon deals 11 D10 radiant damage or half as much against a DC 21 dex save. The stat block is also lacking a bit in terms of legendary actions, only allowing it to cast a spell or make an additional attack with its tail. But it's worth noting that this dragon has access to spells such as Invisibility, Calm Emotions, and Revivify, which might make it convenient for you to have this particular breed as an ally rather than an enemy. And as we near the end of our list and approach my favorite of all the dragons in Fizban's treasury, I'd like to take a moment to mention one other dragon that I didn't give a spot to on a technicality. And since you're technically getting one extra, maybe take a second to like the video and subscribe to the channel. <laughs> I'd really appreciate it. For our honorable mention, I really couldn't help but place the Elder Brain Dragon in front of your eye holes. <laughs> This thing is an absolute monstrosity and is every bit as intimidating as the picture might indicate. The only reason I didn't place it as my number one pick is simply that it isn't exactly a subspecies of dragon. As a matter of fact, any dragon, any dragon at all, can become one of these. According to Fizban, the limit of a Mind Flayer community is based on the reach of its elder brain, the hive mind that exerts its control on those under its influence. However, that reach can extend greatly, if not indefinitely, if the Illithids manage to capture a dragon alive. The Mind Flayers use this opportunity to magically bind the dragon whilst the Elder Brain latches onto its back and controls the dragon's body with a multitude of tentacles. And 
Voila, you now have a deadly enemy that can infect other life forms to its heart's content with a breath weapon that can actually turn you and the rest of your party into mind flayers as well. And so with that safely put away, we finally arrive at our last entry, and I think I may have some people with disagreements on this in the comments, but make sure to listen to what I've got to say first, and I think I'll make my case pretty clear on this one. These dragons are known as masterminds that prefer not to be involved in conflict directly. Constantly attempting to hide their own involvement in wars, murders, and disappearances, many individuals in a given campaign setting might argue that they don't even exist. And in part, that's what makes them so terrifying. To seek out evil with no weakness of pride or consideration for life, while also remaining hidden in the shadows of the Underdark, yes, that's right, my number one pick for the raddest dragon in this book is the Deep Dragon even if they do look like this. I don't blame you if you're not convinced yet, but let's go over what this thing can do, starting with the type of place that it lives in. As I mentioned before, this dragon lives exclusively in the Underdark. This alone means that simply getting to one of these creatures could be an entire campaign. Being a top predator in the Underdark means living below drow cities, Durgar settlements, and a plethora of evil creatures that also call the Underdark home. Before you even make it to its lair, this deep dragon exudes an aura that makes it difficult to complete a long rest. Granted, the check needs to be made only at a DC 10 con save, but even one party member with a level of exhaustion at this point could hamstring the rest of the adventure. In fact, the deep dragon is counting on it. Assuming you're able to find this creature's lair, a deep dragon has the ability to cast slow on intruders, create a sludge-like difficult terrain on all surfaces of their lair, and once you're in deep enough, they can create a cloud of toxic spores that deal 4d6 poison damage and give the poison condition against a DC 15 con save. These layer actions don't seem like much on their own, but when used in conjunction with each other, and when used at just the right times, like a deep dragon would know to do, they can whittle down any capable adventuring party into a slow mass of poisoned bodies just withering away, unable to escape the layer fast enough. But Alex, poison damage is one of the most resisted types of damage in the game, and a DC 15 con save isn't even that high. I hear you, and I know you don't sound like that, but you're forgetting something here. You're there to take this guy out. He's probably causing problems for you on the surface world, even from his little hole in the ground. You can't just leave. And this dragon is patient enough to wait for you as you accrue damage and fail checks. Perhaps he'll just wait until most of your party isn't looking too hot, and then it doesn't matter if you're immune to poison. Perhaps he'll wait until it's just a couple of you left standing. Just a couple of mortals against this ancient dragon stat block. And here is where it really gets good. Based on its stat block, this dragon will likely attempt to continue breaking you down bit by bit by changing its shape into a creature that can't easily be found in the dark, while still benefiting from its blind sight get too close and it might use its nightmare breath on you and the rest of your slow, poisoned, and disoriented party. The breath weapon is a 90-foot cone of spores that forces each creature within to make a DC-19 wisdom save or take 9d10 psychic damage and be frightened of the dragon for the next minute. Sure, the creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, but I'd wager that this extra little bit of chaos would serve as plenty opportunity for this creature to fly, burrow, or swim away. And while your party try to pull yourselves back together from being exhausted and poisoned and all the other stuff, this thing is taking legendary actions every single round. It can use commanding spores within 30 feet of a creature and force them to make an attack against another random creature within reach or take 2d10 psychic damage itself if nothing is close enough. And what's worse, it also has enough legendary actions to use spore salvo in the same round. This furthers the chance of a party member being poisoned as it is surrounded by poisonous spores and must make a DC 19 con save 
or take 8d6 poison damage and contract the poison condition. The one saving grace for your party here is that this creature only has about 200 hit points. If you can find it and deal with it fast enough, you may yet come out unscathed. But chances are, the Deep Dragon will always be two steps ahead of any plan that you come up with. So, did I miss any of your favorites? Was there a detail that I maybe glossed over that you really enjoyed? Please let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear your opinions. And as always, if you're enjoying the content, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and like the video. As I mentioned before, we're still a pretty small channel, so every little bit helps out. And until next time, go out there and make some chaos.